Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror thriller TV series named American Horror Story Season 10 Double Feature Part 1. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The first story titled Red Tide begins with a family of three, Harry and his wife Doris, as well as their daughter Alma, driving on the coastal highway. They were in the beach town of Provincetown on a family vacation. As Harry marveled at the beautiful scenery along the way, Alma was busy counting something. Upon her mother's questioning, Alma explained that she was counting the number of animals that had been run over on the roadside. Suddenly, Harry slammed on the brakes. There was a dead deer lying in the middle of the road. Harry stopped the car to check, while Doris reminded him not to touch the animal, fearing the transmission of Lyme disease. After the brief interruption, the family continued their journey and arrived at a villa in the town, which was being looked after by a property manager for the house owner. As the family was about to enter the house, Alma blurted out that the place looked haunted. Harry didn't take it seriously, saying that all the houses in the isolated town were rumored to be haunted by the spirits of whalers who had died at sea. After entering the house, the subsequent conversation revealed that Harry is a TV scriptwriter, and his pregnant wife Doris used to be a teacher for a while. She has a high taste in interior decoration, which caught the attention of the house owner. They contacted Doris via social media and promised her a three-month free stay in exchange for her help with redecorating the house. After the property manager handed over the keys to Harry, she left the house. Alma expressed her eagerness to see her own room. Meanwhile, Harry, curious about the town, decided to explore the local supermarket on his own. On his way to the supermarket, Harry noticed several red lights flashing. While checking out, a disturbed individual suddenly appeared, urgently advising Harry to leave the village quickly or else something bad would happen. The supermarket owner quickly intervened and sent the troubled person away. He then explained to Harry that the individual named Karen seemed to be suffering from tuberculosis but meant no harm. Harry mentioned he was from New York, where such occurrences are not uncommon, and so he was unfazed. It turned out that the supermarket owner's sister was the same property manager. At that moment, Harry noticed that Karen, who had already left the store, was still staring at him from outside the window. The next morning, Alma began practicing the violin while Doris was tidying up the house, and Harry had to begin writing a TV series for Daniel C.C. Movie Channel in fear that he would be fired. However, he struggled to find inspiration, with his mind fixated on the image of a fox by the seaside, and Alma's violin playing increasingly irritated him. He asked her to stop practicing for a while. Seeing Harry's discomfort, Doris suggested taking Alma out for a walk. They ended up in a nearby cemetery, where Doris kept reminding her daughter about the prevalence of Lyme disease. Suddenly, a very intimidating man appeared with his pale, bald head and stared at Doris, which frightened her. She quickly took her daughter back home, but the pale man followed them persistently and even tried to enter the house, though he was ultimately thwarted by Harry. Later, Harry and Doris reported the incident to the local police, but the chief dismissed their concerns, suggesting the pale man might have been on drugs and reassuring them that their town is safe. However, Doris did not feel safe at all and shared her knowledge of Lyme disease with the police, hinting that the man might be infected. The officer took offense as if being told how to do her job and left them with a dismissive attitude. Harry then asked Doris if she wanted to leave, but after some thought, she decided that staying was a rare opportunity for them both, so they continued their stay. At night, Alma was already fast asleep like a piggy when she suddenly heard a tapping at the window. She went over to see what it was and was shocked to find the pale man who had chased them during the day, along with two others who looked just like him. After she screamed, Harry and Doris rushed to her room to see what was happening. Harry wanted to call the police, but after the police's disappointing response earlier that day, Doris was disheartened. She decided to have her daughter sleep with her that night. Harry, on the other hand, was too troubled by the events to focus on his writing. The next morning, Harry went for his usual run by the sea and stumbled upon two bodies on the beach with their entrails exposed, a truly gruesome sight. He immediately called the police. After the scene was cleared, Harry asked about the nature of the wounds. One of the officers nonchalantly suggested it might have been a great white shark, but said they'd have to wait for the autopsy results. Harry was skeptical but had to wait and see. He didn't mention any of this to his wife, wanting to relieve some of the stress they were under. Instead, he planned to take her out for a nice dinner at a restaurant in town that evening, which she was thrilled to hear about. They had the property manager come over to watch their daughter for the night. While the pregnant Doris was getting ready, she suddenly felt sick and ended up vomiting. 
Initially thinking it was morning sickness, Doris quickly dismissed the idea, saying she was too far along in her pregnancy for that. She couldn't think of any other reason except perhaps the stress of recent events. This episode made her decide against going to the restaurant, and she urged Harry to go on his own to have a drink and relax. Harry wanted to stay and take care of his wife, but eventually went to the restaurant after her persistent persuasion. At the restaurant, the vibrant red lights were quite striking. While Harry was sipping a drink alone at the bar, a girly man named Mickey approached and offered to buy him a drink. Harry clarified that he was married, but Mickey kept flirting, making Harry feel a bit awkward. He promptly called over the waiter, saying he had a reservation, and soon the restaurant's entertainment began. The entertainer duo, Austin and Belle, sang light and easygoing songs that helped lighten Harry's mood. He called Doris to ask if she wanted anything to eat, but she had already laid down and told him she was going to sleep, then hung up the phone to rest. Little did she know, more pale men were gathering at their doorstep. Harry was enjoying some downtime at the restaurant when the two entertainers who had performed earlier unexpectedly bought him a drink. Harry quickly went over to thank them. As it turned out, Belle and Austin were also writers and had noticed that Harry seemed to be struggling with something. They introduced themselves and it became apparent that they were well known in the literary community. Harry was particularly fond of Belle's writing style. During their conversation, Austin mentioned that they come to this place every winter because it seems to have a magical quality that inspires them, allowing them to write a best-selling novel by the next spring. Just as Harry was sharing his current writing difficulties, Karen, the neurotic woman with tuberculosis from the supermarket, burst into the restaurant. She started collecting leftover food in a plastic bag until a waiter intervened. Austin jokingly told the waiter to let her take the leftovers. At that comment, Karen looked over at Austin and also noticed Harry. She hurried over asking why Harry hadn't left yet and warned him to stay away from those two vampires. Later that night, after Harry ensured his daughter and wife were safe and had locked all the doors and windows, he went downstairs to continue writing. Suddenly, a pale man appeared in the house and attacked Harry like a zombie. In a critical moment, Harry grabbed an iron pipe and smashed the man's bald head in. The scene shifts to Belle, who is with Mickey on a bed, the girly man who had flirted with Harry earlier. Belle expressed a desire to take a hit off of Mickey, but he refused, saying that he almost died the last time because of her. She argued that it was because he had been using magic substances, which had also excited her. After offering more money, Mickey reluctantly agreed. Belle then took a sharp object from her necklace and cut Mickey's arm, beginning to drink from it. The waiter had just taken out the trash when Karen hurried over to rummage for food. Her phone suddenly rang, and she seemed to know who was calling. Without even answering, she began to cry. Then she picked up the call, muttering that she couldn't do this. A voice came through, saying she had only three hours and then hung up. Karen's crying grew louder upon hearing this. Back at home, Harry had already called the police. They removed the body and cleaned up the scene. The police chief told Harry to come to the station to make a statement, emphasizing that the attacker had gone mad because of the magic substances. But Harry insisted that the man didn't seem to be there to steal anything. It looked like he just wanted to bite through Harry's throat. The police didn't say much else, only that Harry should come to her office the next day for a statement. After the police left, Doris rushed over to comfort Harry, and he told her they would leave the eerie place tomorrow. In the middle of the night, Karen ran to Belle's house, clutching a bag from which came the sound of a baby crying. Belle threw a bag that looked like the magic substances onto the floor. Karen explained that she wasn't helping Belle for the pills, but because Belle had once promised to protect her from harm if she did as told. Karen handed over her bag and ran off with the supplies from the floor, while the baby's cries echoed loudly in the silent night. The next day, as Harry was packing to leave, the phone rang. It was Austin who asked Harry to come over. Harry said they were about to leave the area, but Austin tempted him with something that could help Harry overcome his writer's block. Intrigued, Harry went to his place, where Austin produced a black pill from a box and tossed it to him, claiming it was unnamed but could inspire writers. Austin shared that he used to be just like Harry, with no one reading his work until a colleague gave him this pill, which brought him endless inspiration. Harry felt there must be side effects, so he tossed the pill onto the table. As he was about to leave, Austin slipped the pill into Harry's pocket, urging him to at least try it, promising he wouldn't regret it. After Harry got home, he was packing when he received a call from Daniel C.C. Movie Studio. The boss got straight to the point, telling Harry he needed to finish his draft that very day, and then proceeded to put pressure on him. Harry was so annoyed that he threw the phone away. At a loss for what to do, he felt the pill in his pocket and on a whim, swallowed one. His daughter witnessed this moment. 
After that, the family is just about to get into the car and leave. As the car starts, a flood of creative ideas starts to spark in Harry's mind. He immediately takes out his packed laptop and returns to the house to start writing the script. Harry's mind is gushing with inspiration, ideas bursting forth continuously. Meanwhile, Alma starts practicing the piano beside him. The piece is difficult and she keeps making mistakes, which frustrates her, who aspires to be a top musician. While Doris is comforting her daughter, Alma reveals that her father had taken a black pill. Seeing her father's transformation, she also wants to try it. Of course, Doris would not allow this and goes to ask Harry what he has taken. By this time, Harry has been writing for four hours straight and shows no sign of stopping. Confronted by her questions, Harry becomes irritable and outright denies taking any pills. At this point, Alma runs over and reiterates that she saw her father take a pill. Now furious, Harry accuses his daughter of being jealous of his inspiration because she can't even play a simple song properly. This frightens both his wife and daughter. Harry suddenly realizes what he's done and apologizes to Alma. Doris starts an argument with Harry, but at this point, Harry seems to have changed, sarcastically telling his wife she's incapable of doing anything. After driving his wife and daughter away, Harry returns to his computer and continues writing, going on for the entire day. A calm down Doris made dinner for Harry, but Harry barely took a bite and spat it out. Doris quickly checked and found nothing wrong with the food, but Harry expressed that he just wanted to be alone, so Harry continued writing into the next day. When Doris woke up and came downstairs, she saw that Harry had finished his manuscript. She discovered that this time, the article was exceptionally good. Harry, who seemed to have returned to normal, finally felt tired and decided to go to the supermarket to buy some of his favorite things. On his way to the supermarket, the pale men who had previously harassed his family appeared once again, one of them consuming a dead animal. When the pale men noticed Harry, they approached him, but this time they did not attack. They seemed to have lost interest in Harry. Upon arriving at the supermarket, as Harry searched for the food he craved, he was startled by the sight of steaks with blood in the freezer, which made his heart race. The supermarket owner appeared and asked Harry why he hadn't left yet, wondering if a burst of inspiration had hit him. Harry inquired how the owner knew about it, but he just mysteriously shook his head, signaling that the town might be aware of the magic pill. As the old man walked away, Karen appeared once again. She could tell that Harry had taken the pill and incessantly questioned why he would try such a thing before leaving in a huff. A baffled Harry didn't dwell on it and hurried home. Once there, he poured the blood from the meat packaging into a cup and drank it down, but he was still not satisfied. He then took out a blender, put all the raw meat into it, and extracted the blood. After consuming it, he showed a look of contentment and then continued with his writing. Upstairs, Doris and Alma were talking. Alma was eager to leave, but Doris remarked that she had never seen Harry write with such fervor since she met him and didn't want to interrupt him. Alma brought up the idea of taking the pill again, but Doris explained to her that there are no shortcuts to success. Outside the house, Austin and Belle were in the car, watching and peeping. Austin was already aware of Harry's use of the pill and knew that once the effects wore off, Harry would come to them again. Now they were on the hunt for fresh food. By the next day, Harry had written through the night. When Doris asked him when he planned to leave, Harry said in another day or two. While making breakfast, Doris cut her hand. Harry's heart raced again, and he impulsively began to suck on Doris's finger. Afterward, Harry suddenly became aware of his bizarre behavior. He went to Austin's house to find out exactly what the pill was. Austin explained that over a decade ago, the town was plagued by drug abuse. An unknown person started experimenting with a secret recipe to make the substances and accidentally created the black pill. If a talented person took it, it could greatly enhance their skills. However, an ordinary person would turn into someone like the pale, bald man who attacked Harry's family. The only side effect of the pill was that it depleted the minerals in the person's blood and one could die without timely replenishment. Ordinary blood wasn't sufficient. Fresh, human blood was needed. Harry, still lucid, tossed the pill back to Austin, declaring that he would rather not have such abilities if that was the cost. But Austin was confident that he would be back. Harry returned home and apologized to Doris, mentioning that he had been meaning to leave. Just then, Harry's boss called again. It turned out that the script Harry had written was outstanding. After the producer read it, he handed it over to the most celebrated Joker in film history. The actor was so impressed with the script that he agreed to be part of the production for free. Netflix, famous for its streaming service, also showed interest and sent over a substantial budget upon reviewing the script. This sudden windfall made Harry and Doris jump for joy. Harry hurried back to his computer to finish the rest of the script, but as expected, his mind went blank and he couldn't write anymore. 
Harry visited Austin's house again. Austin had anticipated Harry's return, but Harry retorted that he only needed one pill. Bell bluntly stated that success is addictive, that once you've tried it, you'll always want more. Harry knew this deep down, so he asked Bell what he should do. Bell and Austin showed their unbrushed teeth, inviting Harry to hunt with them. On the way to hunt, Bell laid out two rules for being a vampire. One must not feed in the town because the new police chief is very nosy. Bell then handed Harry a pair of gloves, explaining that the second rule is never to take them off. As a vampire, feeding once a week was sufficient, and their victims were typically addicts to keep things concealed. Karen, who seems to have gone mad, is ill and vomiting, asking Mickey to take her in. It's clear Mickey is kind-hearted to her. During their conversation, it's revealed that Mickey used to love watching Daniel C.C. horror movies and had tried writing scripts but never completed them. He then pulls out a pill he'd stolen from Belle and suggests they try it together. Karen immediately stops him, knowing the consequences of taking it. Suddenly, Mickey shows Karen several paintings from the corner, which she recognizes as her own from a training she had attended. Mickey keeps praising Karen's artwork and talent, tempting her to take the pill with him. However, Karen manages to stay calm, while Mickey, with his mind made up, takes the pill on his own. The three in search of food arrived at a junkie's house. Upon entering, Belle took out a knife and killed the man. Confronted with the fresh minerals flowing from the man's arm, Harry couldn't resist any longer and pounced to feed. On their way back, Belle asked Harry how he felt now. Harry admitted to feeling a bit guilty, but overall much better than before. Belle then suggested that Harry should visit the dentist for some dental work. The next day, Harry went to the dentist's office. From their conversation, it was apparent that she became a dentist because of her parents. After taking a black pill, her skills had significantly improved. She had even invented the sharp teeth herself, and she proceeded to adjust Harry's teeth. Meanwhile, Alma resumed her piano practice, but still couldn't play well. Frustrated, she found the pill in Harry's bag and swallowed one. Suddenly, the difficult pieces she was struggling with became effortless. After practicing for four or five hours, Doris came to her daughter, complaining of a severe headache and asking her to rest. However, Alma seemed transformed, claiming her mother couldn't understand the greatness of art. She even went as far as to say that her mother wanted to leave because she was jealous of her and her father's inspiration. Infuriated by this, Doris told Alma to get lost, but couldn't help crying after her daughter left. Mickey, who had taken the pill, was also continuously creating. The following morning, Harry went for a run as usual and encountered a handsome man. The man thought Harry was there for fun. However, Harry pulled out a knife and stabbed the man, craving for his fresh blood. Doris woke up at home to find her daughter's violin by her bed, but she couldn't find Alma anywhere. Heading downstairs, she came across Harry writing, with blood at the corner of his mouth. Harry licked it clean and casually explained that he had cut himself while shaving. He then mentioned that Alma had gone out for a walk. This alarmed Doris, especially since they had previously been attacked by a pale man. An argument ensued with Harry, during which she declared her intention to take Alma and leave this place, but Harry remained indifferent, continuing his writing. Frantic, Doris took to the streets, calling out for Alma. Passing by the graveyard, she caught sight of the pale man in the distance, and then found Alma at a tombstone, with a dead rabbit in her mouth. Doris quickly brought Alma home, roughly washing off the blood in fear of Lyme disease. Harry was drawn by their daughter's crying, and urged Doris to be gentler. However, an angry Doris yelled at Harry that Alma was feasting on the blood of a rabbit. Harry then realized that his daughter must have taken one of the pills. Meanwhile, the police showed up at their door. Someone had complained about seeing Alma covered in blood at the graveyard, and considering the recent discovery of multiple bodies at the docks, they suspected a connection between Alma and the corpses. Just as the police were about to take Alma away, Doris felt a sharp pain in her abdomen and fell down the stairs. Thankfully, after a checkup, the baby in her womb was fine. However, the doctor advised her to stay in the hospital for observation. Harry sent Alma away, who was transfixed by the blood bags at the entrance of the ward. But Harry noticed in time and made her come to her senses. He then assured Doris that he would take Alma back to New York, which finally put Doris's mind at ease. At night, Harry returned to the town with his daughter. He was deceiving Doris. In the car, Harry wondered when Alma had taken the pill. Alma explained that it was that evening when she couldn't play Paganini's piece. After taking the pill, she found the music much simpler. As a background here, Paganini was an Italian genius violinist. Legend has it that he was able to play unparalleled music because he had made a deal with the devil. Sensing something was wrong, Harry hoped Alma would stop. Alma agreed but on one condition. Harry had to quit too. 
Once home, Harry prepared to continue his screenplay, but his mind was blank without the pill, devoid of inspiration. He rummaged through the trash and swallowed another one. At that moment, Alma stood behind him. Harry, with no other choice, gave his daughter a pill. Later at Mew's restaurant, they ordered a rare steak and started planning their next moves. Harry said he would find a way to get the minerals Alma needed, but he was worried about the effects of the pills on her development. Alma, however, didn't care about these things. She just wanted to be the greatest performer. Harry reminded her to keep this a secret from her mother. Alma responded that she thought her mother's designs were ugly and that she and her father didn't need her mother. Then, she said she was hungry. Harry knew what Alma craved, so he drove to a strange woman's house. But just as he was about to act, he was knocked out from behind. When he woke up, he found himself locked up. He smashed the window in the door, and the woman handed him some medicine. It turns out their profession was to kidnap people, then make adult movies to make money, and dispose of the kidnapped afterwards. Harry had no choice but to pretend to swallow the medicine, but when his captors were distracted checking the camera, he spat out the medicine and bit through his restraints, turning the tables on his captors. Afterward, he placed the freshly obtained blood in front of his daughter. After tasting them, she too showed a look of deep satisfaction. The next day, Harry's boss, Ursula, surprisingly showed up at his house early in the morning. She began with some good news for Harry. The famous director of the film Kill Bill had reached out to her, showing that he was interested in Harry's screenplay and wanted to collaborate with him. Ursula then mentioned that her visit was also to see for herself what had caused Harry's sudden surge in talent, and she planned to stay in town for a few days, possibly at the notorious Cortez Hotel. Just then, Alma yelled from upstairs that she was hungry, prompting Harry to see Ursula out. Before leaving, he cautioned her that the town wasn't safe and advised her not to wander alone. That evening, Ursula dined alone at Mew's restaurant, where Austin and Belle were still singing, and Mickey was there too, trying to charm Ursula. The usually haughty Ursula loudly complained to the waitress about how terrible Austin and Belle's singing was. Austin and Belle confronted Ursula with a retort, and before leaving, Belle expressed a wish to see Ursula again because she looked very appetizing. After they left, Mickey approached Ursula, but his obvious signs of overdose frightened her so much that she lost her appetite. The following morning, as Ursula took a walk by the seaside, Mickey appeared again. It turned out that after being rejected the previous night, he had learned from the waitress that Ursula was an agent. Mickey was working on a script and wanted Ursula to take a look. After persistent pleading, Ursula agreed to take the script, much to Mickey's delight. Ursula was captivated after reading Mickey's script that night. The next day, she found Mickey, but first she mocked him, saying that with his drug-addled appearance, it was impossible for him to have written such a good script. She had already been suspicious of the changes in Harry, and now seeing Mickey's ravaged face with a great script, Ursula asked him what had changed them both. Perhaps hoping that Ursula could help him escape this place, Mickey revealed the truth about the pills. Upon hearing this, Ursula asked Mickey to get her more and even wanted to contact the source of the pills. To her, this was a business opportunity. Although Mickey was inclined to warn her about the side effects of the pills, under Ursula's forceful request, he still agreed to comply. In the dead of night, Mickey took advantage of Belle's absence to sneak into her house and find the black pills. Belle was actually out hunting with Austin and Harry, and they had stumbled upon a house with three people inside. They no longer needed to fight for food. After Harry replenished his minerals, he took some back for his daughter in a thermos. This was witnessed by Austin and Belle. On the way back, Belle, gun in hand, confronted Harry about whose blood he was taking. Harry admitted it was for his daughter, which greatly annoyed Belle. She feared Alma might expose their pill-taking secret and threatened Harry with the gun, telling him not to give the pill to Alma anymore. After Belle and Austin escorted Harry home, Austin mentioned that it seemed necessary to eliminate Harry and Alma. The next morning, Mickey went to the docks to hunt for food. He was initially beaten up by his prey. However, he managed to overcome the prey. Returning home satiated, he was surprised to find Belle had also arrived. She had learned of Mickey's theft of the pills and mocked him, stating that despite taking the pill, he could never compare to her. She demanded that Mickey save a portion of his hunt for her in the future, and then instructed Mickey to kill Ursula because she didn't appreciate others critiquing her singing. The scene shifts to the police discovering the pale man killed by Mickey with a witness present. The witness claimed to be an interior designer and babbled on without providing useful information, except to suggest the incident was a case of male-on-male -male violence. 
Following Belle's instructions, Mickey went to Ursula's hotel. Even faced with Mickey holding a knife, the bathing Ursula remained arrogantly calm. As Mickey was about to act, Ursula revealed that she had just sent his script to a studio that was interested in hiring him. Overwhelmed, Mickey dropped the knife and staggered to sit on the toilet. Having lived on the fringes of society, he was moved to hear someone affirming his work for the first time. Mickey seemed to choose Ursula over Belle, likely because Ursula could genuinely help him, while Belle only held contempt for him. Taking advantage of Mickey's emotional state, Ursula again requested to meet the person who made the pills. Mickey subsequently took Ursula to meet the chemist behind the pill production. Ursula proposed a deal, offering to distribute the pills to writers, and once these writers struck it rich, the chemist could take a cut from their earnings. After hearing this, the chemist went to Austin and Bell. She didn't like dealing with strangers, especially someone like Ursula, and asked Austin and Belle to quickly take care of Ursula and also Harry's family, threatening to stop supplying them with the pills otherwise. In the evening, Harry needed to visit Doris at the hospital and asked Ursula to look after his daughter. Before leaving, he took the thermos containing stored blood for his daughter, implying that he was going to hunt some blood for Alma. After Harry left, Ursula expressed that she was tired and went upstairs to sleep. Meanwhile, the police chief, who had been watching Harry's house, entered and wanted to talk to Alma. She expressed her belief that Harry and Alma might be connected to the recent corpses found on the beach. Alma's seemingly innocent answers convinced the chief even more, and she decided to take Alma back to the police station. However, Alma reacted by stabbing the chief in the neck. When Harry returned, he was shocked by the scene in front of him, while Alma and Ursula were nonchalantly playing poker. The scene shifts to five years earlier in Princeton Town. The chemist drove there as October approached, bringing the onset of winter. She was looking for a quiet house with good ventilation, and she was greeted by a real estate agent who was the exact interior designer and had lived in the town for 50 years. Despite sensing the chemist was up to something because of the town's rampant drug problem, the designer didn't think much of it. After their conversation, the chemist bought the house and set up her lab, using a black liquid to finally create the magic pills we've seen. One evening, the chemist went to the Muse restaurant near her home to select test subjects. There, Mickey was hitting on the designer, who yelled at him, telling the junkie to get lost. The chemist witnessed this and approached Mickey, luring him to her home with the promise of money and pleasure. She then began to test Mickey step by step and learned about his writing habits. Revealing her true identity, she told Mickey she was a pharmacist who had been working with the U.S. military. The military wanted her to develop a drug that would reduce soldiers' creativity to prevent them from having too many ideas. Her research showed that creativity stems from the occipital lobe in the brain, where talented individuals have denser neurons. She had developed a drug that specifically stimulated neurons in the occipital lobe and had tested it on animals. Primates with dense neurons in their occipital lobes ended up being able to type on keyboards, but those without dense neurons became aggressive and started to consume the blood of their own kind. Finally, the chemist presented the magic pill to Mickey and asked if he was willing to try it, but Mickey refused. After their conversation, Mickey saw through the chemist's real intentions and wanted to take the money and leave. But before he left, the chemist told Mickey that if he could bring people willing to be test subjects, she would reward him handsomely. Mickey later went to the bar with Karen to watch a performance. By this time, Mickey knew that Karen had a habit of painting, and so he tempted her by asking if she wanted to use someone else's help to create better things. Karen expressed that she didn't want to, and it was also apparent that she was a person with very little confidence, preferring not to continue creating. As the person on stage began to sing, Mickey observed him and got a new target. In the end, this singer came to the chemist's house, stating that it was Mickey who sent him there. In a bookstore, Belle was holding a signing event for her new book, but very few people turned up. As Belle read from her book, it was clear that her writing was excellent, yet the audience was bored and started playing with their phones. The chemist also attended the signing event, but didn't say much, simply buying one of Belle's books before leaving. After the event, Belle confronted her husband, who had promised to attend but did not show up. Facing Belle's questioning, her husband bluntly stated that Belle's books about sex were disgusting. Learning that Belle had only sold one book at her signing, he became angry, scolding her, upset about spending almost all their retirement money on the signing event. Belle meekly hoped her husband would accompany her to watch the sunset later. The angry husband said that life with Belle was too boring and that he had had enough, then he went off on his own. A heartbroken Belle went to the Muse restaurant alone and drank in her sorrows. That's when Mickey approached her, recognizing her from the afternoon book signing. Mickey expressed that he saw Belle as a true writer and admired her deeply. 
Hearing this, a delighted Belle bought Mickey a drink. Afterwards, Belle began to share her true struggles with Mickey, and with his help, she experienced for the first time in her life, joyfully dancing around the bar. The singer, who had previously sought out the chemist, suddenly appeared, and Mickey could tell that he wasn't in good shape. After downing a drink, he rushed to the bathroom to throw up. Then, while washing his hands, he panicked as he noticed his hair starting to fall out incessantly. After her high had subsided, Belle was looking for Mickey to get more happy powders. However, Mickey told her that the second time wouldn't feel the same as the first. He then mentioned he knew someone who could give Belle something special that would keep her happy forever. They went together to find the chemist, who took a while to appear since she had just been reading a book published by Belle, recognizing Belle's remarkable talent. The chemist then produced a magic pill, and by then, Belle had already learned from Mickey about the effects of the magic pill. She wanted to know about any potential side effects, and the chemist explained that it would awaken a certain craving and could cause aggressive behavior, which would also manifest in talented individuals. The chemist further stated that if Belle took the pill, she would have to become a subject of her research. After some consideration, Belle declared she was ready and swallowed it. Belle then returned to her hotel, where ideas began to flash through her mind. She sat down at her computer and started writing non-stop, as if she had chewed a kind of gum that made her unable to stop. She finished writing a nearly 300-page book in one go. The next day, when her husband returned and heard that Belle had completed an entire book, he didn't believe her at all. He grabbed the computer to check and declared that it couldn't possibly have been written by his shitty wife. Faced with her husband's skepticism, Belle suddenly became irate, screaming that she had indeed written it and demanding to know where her husband had been the previous night. Pressed for an answer, her husband panicked and confessed to wrongdoing and said that he planned to continue doing wrong because he had decided to divorce Belle. Upon hearing this, Belle was deeply hurt. Suddenly, her heart started racing, and in a swift motion, she smashed a nearby wine bottle and ended her husband's life. Confronted with the fresh outpour of what seemed to be vital essence, she pounced on it. Belle later visited the chemist and described the feelings she had during the conflict with her husband, saying it was a kind of craving. She could smell the scent of deep-seated minerals in the blood, an uncontrollable urge to absorb them. The chemist was delighted to hear this and explained that their experiments had already shown that certain minerals in the blood of apes disappeared after medication. This explained why Belle felt the compulsion to replenish minerals from fresh blood. The chemist then advised Belle to take care of her husband's situation. A few days later, the designer was arrogantly walking his dog on the beach when he stumbled upon some human body remains. On the other hand, the singer stood before the chemist, completely bald with his skin turning pale. During the chemist's inquiry, it was revealed that the singer had not yet felt the desire to attack others. He insisted he needed more pills, believing that the reaction of hair loss was due to an insufficient dose last time. However, the chemist stated that he must follow her rules and could not medicate again for a few days. Before leaving, the singer mentioned he was feeling very cold, a condition the chemist had never encountered before, and she simply suggested he wear thicker clothing. Afterward, the singer went to a tattoo parlor to buy clothes and chose a Balenciaga-style coat. He then went to a cemetery and struck up a conversation with a woman in fat, but soon he couldn't resist picking up a vase from a tombstone and smashing it, ending the woman's greasy life and beginning to absorb the minerals from her blood. That evening, because it was Halloween, the pale singer walking on the street didn't attract anyone's attention even with his bald head. After knocking on the chemist's door once again, he fearfully confessed his actions. The chemist explained that his previous behavior was partly due to a genuine deficiency of minerals in the blood, but the most significant psychological factor was his knowledge of his lack of talent, which led him to resent everyone around him. In contrast, talented individuals experienced anger after taking the magic pills due to their arrogance. Hearing this, the angry singer wanted to attack the chemist, but she was prepared and warned him never to come to her again. The scene shifts to two years later. Belle walks into a tattoo parlor, expressing her desire for a makeover to try a new style. She casually mentions to the tattoo artist that two years ago, she finished off her husband and dismembered his body, throwing the pieces onto the beach, the same ones found by the designer. The tattoo artist reveals that she had done the same to her previous boyfriend and then asks Belle how long she has been on the medication. It seems that over the two years, the magic pills have become well known in town. From their conversation, it becomes apparent that Belle has published many books in the past two years, and her writing career has flourished. 
The tattoo artist, after taking the medication, developed sharp teeth and has now modified Belle's teeth to match. A transformed Belle heads to a bar that evening, where a costume show is taking place. As she sits down, she overhears a group of drag queens at the next table gossiping. Among them is Austin, in his old form back then, who has taken to performing because it pays well. The other three at his table mock Austin for his cheap clothes and unattractive appearance. When Austin takes the stage, he performs with a dramatic flair. Belle watches him quietly. After the show, Belle buys Austin a drink, recognizing his talent and feeling that he shouldn't be wasting it on such performances. Austin shares his story. He used to be a playwright who had arranged for his play to be staged with a theater owner, but then the owner vanished. After Austin describes the owner's appearance, Belle realizes he's talking about someone she had killed for the blood, but she decides not to tell Austin. Instead, Belle offers Austin a pill, suggesting it will give him a fresh start. Desperate, Austin swallows it but then starts foaming at the mouth. Despite this, he experiences a rush of inspiration and an intense hunger. Belle suggests they get revenge together. They head to the home of the three drag queens, where Belle finishes off everyone present. However, the fattest one escapes to a cemetery to catch her breath, only to be taken out by a pale man who suddenly appears to flex his bald head. The scene shifts to the hospital where Harry is supporting his wife through labor. After a painful delivery, Doris gives birth to a baby boy. Meanwhile, Harry is struggling to suppress his craving for minerals while comforting an exhausted Doris who falls asleep from fatigue. Seeing Doris asleep, Harry can no longer control himself. He wheels a trash can filled with blood-soaked gauze into the bathroom, squeezes the minerals from the gauze into a cup, and gulps it down. The next day, when Doris wakes up, she finds that her family and Ursula are all by her side. Alma seems particularly fascinated by the new baby. At that moment, Doris realizes she's back in the town and urgently asks Harry why they're there. Harry explains that the doctor had warned them Doris might experience postpartum hemorrhage, so she needed to be somewhere with 24-hour supervision. He states that returning to the town was the best choice for both Doris and the baby, assuring her that they are now safe. Meanwhile, a luxury sports car pulls up next to Karen, and to her surprise, Mickey steps out, wearing brand new clothes and a chunky gold necklace. This sudden change surprises Karen a bit. Mickey then invites Karen to join him in the car as he's heading to the beach, which coincidentally is where Karen is going to paint. On the way to the beach, Mickey explains to Karen that he had the studio rent the car for research. Karen quickly realizes that Mickey has become the screenwriter for Fast Track Racing, a job that Ursula had referred him to. Mickey seems dismissive, saying the movie is just an appetizer. The studio is planning a movie universe, and all of this will belong to him in the future. Karen is thrilled to hear all this and genuinely happy for Mickey. He then invites Karen to join them, but Karen is aware of what such an invitation might entail. She immediately asks Mickey to stop the car, then curses him and leaves. In the evening, Doris was suddenly awakened by the sound of a baby crying. She got up to check and followed the cries to the bathroom, where she found Alma licking the foot. Witnessing this scene, Doris fainted from shock. The next day, Harry confronted Alma after learning what had happened, asking her why she would do such a thing to her own brother. Alma replied that she had only taken a small taste and confirmed that the baby's minerals were indeed as delicious as rumored. She happily claimed that she could now play the world's most difficult piece of music. Harry, seeing that Alma felt no remorse for her actions, became furious and yelled at her not to touch her brother again. Alma promised not to do it again, but then reiterated her previous question, asking why her mother was still around. She expressed her disdain for ordinary people like her mother, a side effect that comes from taking the magic pills. Harry angrily stated that he wouldn't give her any more pills if she continued this behavior. When Doris woke up, she found Ursula by her side and quickly inquired about the baby's well-being. Ursula assured her that the baby was fine. She then tried to convince Doris that what she had seen the night before was just a dream. Doris thought about it and said she knew what dreams were and that what she saw was real. However, Ursula continued to dismiss Doris, saying that the anesthesia hadn't worn off yet. Ursula then bragged about how busy Harry had been with his projects, even joining the crew of Avatar, and suggested that if Doris were a good wife, she should support Harry's work. Doris was left speechless and felt she had no choice but to accept the situation. In the evening, while Doris was soothing the baby, she discovered scars on the baby's leg. At that moment, Alma appeared, saying that Harry had sent her to give her mother some medicine. Doris, trying to cover up that she knew the truth, told Alma that she had dreamed about her the night before, but didn't mention what the dream was about, only that it was a nightmare. Alma then pulled out the medicine and suggested that maybe taking it would make Doris feel better. 
Doris took the medicine and noticed a black pill hidden among many others. She immediately called for Harry and asked him what the black pill was, and then she accused Alma of trying to poison her and harm the baby. Ursula quickly intervened, suggesting that Doris might be suffering from postpartum depression and had hurt the baby without realizing it. Doris stated she wasn't crazy and showed Harry the baby's wounds. As Harry tried to cover it up, Alma admitted that she wanted her mother to take the magic pill so that she could become one of them. Alma explained to Doris that the pills could enhance abilities, which was why she and Harry had changed. Ursula also supported Alma's claim, promoting the benefits of taking the pill. While Doris was still trying to make sense of everything, Alma held up a glass of water. Doris took the glass, but she smashed it, picked up the baby, and ran out of the house. As she fled into the streets, she encountered many pale men. Fortunately, Harry arrived in time, and the pale men stopped their attack. A terrified Doris had to follow Harry back home, feeling overwhelmed. The next day, Karen was painting on the beach when Belle suddenly appeared. It turned out that Belle had found out about the new baby in town and had demanded that Karen bring the infant to her once more. Belle had even brought a host of pale men in an attempt to intimidate Karen. Karen flatly refused her request. In response, Belle stepped onto Karen's painting and then explained why she needed the baby. The minerals in the baby's body were incredibly pure, untainted by any pollution, but they would slowly degrade over time. Finally, Belle threatened Karen again, saying that if Karen didn't bring her the baby, she would make sure Karen lost her sight and could no longer paint. Doris woke up once more, and after checking on the baby, she felt defeated. She found scissors in the room and made her way downstairs, her eyes fixated on Alma. Meanwhile, Harry was chatting with the designer. While looking at Doris's work, the designer continuously criticized her designs. At that moment, Harry noticed Doris coming downstairs and stopped the designer. Upon seeing Doris, the designer didn't forget to mock her first, suggesting that she should take the scissors and cut down the curtains hanging in her dressing room. Harry tried to smooth things over, asking Doris why she wasn't upstairs feeding the baby. He then introduced the designer, saying that he had invited him to help with Doris's work. The designer quickly chimed in, saying that Doris's designs were a bit ugly. Just then, the baby's cries were heard from upstairs, and poor Doris was once again deceived into going back up. Mickey was tidying up the room and casually took out one of Karen's old paintings. Suddenly, Karen came running in, shouting and telling Mickey about the task Belle had forced upon her. Karen was afraid of the threat, but Mickey seemed unfazed. He took out a magic pill again, suggesting that if she wanted to stop being threatened by Belle, she would have to take the pill. An angry Karen threw it from Mickey's hand and then told him that she had always obeyed Belle, but this time she wanted to protect the baby and even raise it herself. She wanted a fresh start, and saving the baby was also a form of redemption for herself. In the end, she told Mickey that if he still loved her, he should help her. After her persistent pleading, Mickey finally agreed to help her. In the dead of night, Doris was soothing the baby when her daughter ran into the room and asked what name she intended to give her brother. Doris expressed that she knew what Alma had done to the baby. Alma stated that the minerals were much tastier than those of adults. Upon hearing this, a frightened Doris quickly moved the baby aside and then told Alma that she could not do such things to the baby anymore. Alma changed her attitude, admitted her mistake, and promised not to err again. However, she then used reverse psychology on her mother, suggesting that Harry didn't dare give Doris the pill because he didn't think she was good enough, and then tempted her with the various successes that could be achieved by taking the pill. In the end, a helpless Doris took the pill fed to her by her daughter. Alma hugged her mother, saying she loved her, but her expression was very cold. The next morning, Alma was practicing a difficult piece of music, while Doris was in the bedroom, continuously sketching design drafts for the house. However, she seemed dissatisfied with her own work, becoming increasingly irritable and eventually vomited. In the evening, Alma asked Harry and Ursula to accompany her to dinner at a restaurant, leaving Doris alone in the room on purpose. As soon as they left, Karen and Mickey arrived at Harry's house. They broke the glass on the door to enter, and the sound of the breaking glass woke Doris, who quickly got up to check. Just as the two entered the bedroom, they were shocked to see the transformed Doris. Karen was so scared that she ran out of the house, neglecting the child, and then encountered a wandering pale man. Fortunately, Mickey appeared just in time to rescue Karen. Afterward, Mickey sat down beside Karen and took out a pill. He pleaded with Karen to take the magic pill, promising that it would allow them to be together, to become wealthy, and to find happiness. But Karen, just as before, rejected Mickey's offer and told him she didn't want to take it. 
She didn't want to become like Mickey, someone who couldn't even be called human. Hearing that, Mickey left a pill for Karen and stormed off in anger. Just as the pale man was about to attack Karen, she chose to swallow the pill amidst tears. At the same time, Doris at home seemed to have lost her clarity of mind. After shaving her head, she donned a coat, picked up a kitchen knife, and approached the baby. Harry appeared just in time to stop her. Unable to cope with Doris's state, he had no choice but to confine her in the bathroom. Soon after, Alma revealed that it was she who, with Ursula's help, had given the magic pill to her mother, knowing well the consequences. Ursula reassured Harry, insisting they didn't really need Doris. But faced with his estranged wife, Harry found it difficult to let go. After taking the pill, Karen was extremely anxious. Having witnessed Doris's transformation, she feared she would end up like the pale man. But with Mickey's constant reassurance, she gradually calmed down. Mickey also stressed that the most pressing matter was to replenish Karen's minerals. The next day, Harry went upstairs where Doris had lost her sanity and even attempted to attack him. Harry sat down beside her and bid her a final farewell. While expressing regret for Doris, he also felt pride in his own achievements. He then released Doris, and as she wandered out of the house without any consciousness, both her husband and daughter watched. At this moment, Alma took her father's hand, and Harry showed a long-missed smile. Karen and Mickey headed to the beach and spotted a man camping in the distance. Mickey suggested that they should make the man their lunch. However, Karen, out for her first hunt, seemed preoccupied and heavy-hearted. Mickey continuously encouraged Karen to embrace her new self and assured her that he'd always be there to support her. Karen replied that she would do her best to help them both and then, unexpectedly, bit into Mickey's neck. After Mickey fell, Karen took out some paper and began to draw beside his body. Upon finishing her drawing, she walked toward the ocean, slashed her own arm with a knife on the beach, and then proceeded to walk into the depths of the sea until she disappeared. At night, Ursula and Alma went to find the chemist, with Ursula planning to use the charming Alma to persuade the chemist to give her more pills so she could build her own talent pool. But as they passed through the graveyard, they suddenly saw Doris in the distance. Alma just left with a look of contempt for her mother. The scene shifts to the seaside in Provincetown, where two fishermen are about to go out to sea. But shortly after setting off, it seems their Tesla boat hits something. As the crew went to check, they discovered a nearly decomposed body. It's the police chief who was stabbed by Alma. The scene then switches to the province town council, where the attention of everyone is captured by a state trooper from Massachusetts taking the stage. The state trooper announced her visit was to investigate the murder of the town's police chief. However, council members dismissively suggested that the police chief might have had an accident. They showed little concern for her death, but later revealed they feared that media coverage of the adverse events would affect their summer income, which they relied on for living expenses in winter. They hoped to prevent state police involvement. The state trooper, sensing the intentional concealment, stated her determination to uncover the truth and then chose to leave. Within the council, the designer hurriedly assured the vice chair that he would take care of the matter. Notably, in the council room, two rainbow flags, symbols of the LGBT community, were displayed. This is in keeping with both the TV show's depiction and the reality of Provincetown as a place that has always been very welcoming to diverse groups. The designer assumed that Austin and his group were responsible for the police chief's murder. So after the meeting, he sought out Austin, Bell, and the chemist, hoping they could resolve the issue. Austin clarified that they had not laid hands on the police chief and that the act was perpetrated by a family from Hollywood. Although the designer knew it was not Austin's group who had acted against the police chief, he insisted that the trouble had arisen because of them and demanded they settle the matter promptly. Before leaving, the designer dropped a threatening remark, noting that he had once stopped Burger King from operating in town and certainly had enough clout to do the same to the chemist. In the evening, Ursula was reviewing Harry's newly written script. After reading it, she proclaimed it the best she had ever seen, even comparing Harry's work to Moby Dick, the greatest American novel written by Herman Melville in 1851. At the moment of the script's completion, Harry announced to Ursula and Alma that he had written enough works over the winter and had decided that he would no longer take the magic pills, as he no longer wished to kill and wanted to start enjoying life and try to find his humanity again. Harry seemed to retain some sanity in his heart. However, this decision displeased Alma, who accused her father of being selfish, only caring about his own achievements. Ursula also stepped in to dissuade Harry from stopping, suggesting that success requires the sacrifice of one's conscience and morals. Seeing he could not convince his boss, Harry reassured his daughter that he could now be by her side to support her dreams and be a proper family. 
Harry hoped Alma would understand him, and in turn, Alma's attitude softened. She smiled and affirmed Harry's thoughts, then hugged him and said she loved him. However, her eyes bore the same expression when she had her mother take the pills. The next day, Harry bought Alma some health supplements that could enhance memory to help them get through the withdrawal period more easily. It was then that Harry saw a fleeting figure outside the window. He thought it was his wife. Alma once again shared her opinion about her mother, saying that her mother was no longer human. Alma urged Harry to forget Doris as soon as possible, but at that moment Alma realized that someone had broken their front door. Harry rushed upstairs to check on the baby, only to find that the baby had disappeared, leaving behind only a note. It turned out to be from Belle, asking Harry to meet them that evening and emphasizing that he must bring Alma along. Anxious Harry was getting ready to go to Bell, though he suspected it might be a trap, as Bell and the others probably wanted to deal with him for his past act of medicating Alma. Of course, Harry didn't want to take Alma with him, but at that time, Alma was unusually calm, declaring that she wasn't afraid at all and insisted on joining him to rescue the baby, especially since they had Ursula's support. Ursula agreed with Alma, saying they should face Belle together, but she decided not to join them just yet. Alma could only angrily call Ursula a coward, not knowing that Ursula had plans to go somewhere else. That night, Ursula arrived at the cemetery alone, surrounded by pale men who eyed her menacingly. Despite her fear, Ursula shouted at them, giving them a torrent of motivational speeches, telling them that although everyone had made terrible decisions, it wasn't the end. There was always a second choice. Ursula then took out a bottle of magic pills, claiming they were the latest research based on a new formula. Not only were they more potent than the previous ones, but they also had no side effects, and most importantly, could cure them. However, the pale men around her seemed not to understand Ursula's words at all, and just kept moving closer to her. On the other side, Harry and Alma arrived at Belle's house. Harry was about to embrace the baby when Belle pulled out a knife and told Harry to back off. At that moment, Austin and the chemist also appeared. Harry explained that he had just completed his work and was about to take the children and leave town. They had stopped taking the medication and now just wanted to return to their previous life. However, Belle and the others did not believe that Harry could manage to stop taking the pills for good. Austin and Belle, knives in hand, approached Harry and Alma. Just as they were about to harm Harry, a group of pale men broke into Belle's house from outside. The chemist immediately took the baby away, while Harry and Alma hid under a table. The pale men began attacking Belle and Austin, eventually killing them both. Just as the pale men were about to continue their assault on Harry and Alma, Ursula appeared with a gun and took down all the pale men present. While Harry was still in shock, the chemist reappeared with the baby. It seems when Ursula took Alma to see the chemist previously, they must have reached an agreement. Harry checked on his daughter's condition and assured her that they would be okay and would return to their previous life together. But at that moment, Alma stated that she wanted to become the best musician and didn't want her father to hold her back. Then she opened her mouth, removed her braces, and bit her father on the neck. Meanwhile, Ursula and the chemist began discussing the new pills. Ursula suggested that based on the recent experiment, the new pills seemed very successful. However, the chemist said that these were actually old pills that had been discarded because they could cause strange behaviors, making those who took them harm each other. This also explained why the pale men harmed Belle and Austin, but not Ursula. Afterward, the chemist and Ursula concocted a story that all this was the result of a drug-induced frenzy by Harry, who went on a killing spree. They planned to use this story to deceive the state police and cover up the incident with the magic pills. Finally, Ursula decided to take the chemist to Los Angeles, where they could produce the pills on a larger scale. The scene shifts to three months later when tourists enjoyed their time around Hollywood. Suddenly, a pale police officer appeared among the crowd, and without warning, he bit into a tourist. Panic ensued as bystanders fled in terror. Thankfully, other police officers were quick to respond and the pale officer was shot dead before he could cause more chaos. Back at home, the chemist and Alma watched the news report unfold. It was revealed that this pale officer was the fifth such assailant in recent times. It turns out these officers had been manipulated by the chemist into taking a particular pill. The chemist targeted these individuals because they were deemed societal refuse, racists who would not be missed. In the future, she planned to continue administering the drug to corrupt cops in the city. Meanwhile, Ursula had just returned home, her phone conversation revealing that she had been busy dispensing these pills in search of potential geniuses. 
That day, Ursula had handed out pills at Starbucks to the creative types who frequented the coffee shop, inadvertently creating more pale men. The chemist questioned Ursula's method, arguing that no self-respecting writer would choose Starbucks as a place to write. Alma chimed in nonchalantly, dismissing them as talentless trash regardless. Later, Alma arrived at the iconic Disney concert hall to audition for the symphony orchestra. Her performance on stage captivated the judges, leaving them visibly moved. Alma and another candidate were selected for a further interview. The conversation between them revealed Alma's supreme confidence. Without having heard the other's performance, she asserted she was far superior. This provoked the other candidate to list his musical accomplishments, warning Alma that her arrogance might cost her the job. The candidate's continued mockery angered Alma. When the staff returned, however, the other candidate had disappeared, only to be found later with a broken neck, presumably bitten. Elsewhere, a scriptwriting class was in session at a school when Ursula was introduced as a guest speaker. It seemed she had shifted her focus from Starbucks to academic settings. After a spirited introduction, Ursula invited the students to take the pills hidden under their seats. When the original teacher attempted to intervene, mistaking the pills for stimulants, Ursula boldly dismissed him. She then began to tempt the young minds into taking the pills. As the students ingested the pills, the scene shifted to the streets where a mass of pale men attacked pedestrians. The chemist watched from her car, a baby in the back seat. Before leaving, she whispered to the infant about their next endeavor, to develop a new drug that might grant eternal youth. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.